Hello everybody. Hope you're all doing well and thank you for taking the time to join me this evening. It's great to see a lot of familiar names popping up. Good to see some new names that I haven't seen before. <clears throat> so thank you for taking the time. Nick, good morning. From my side, I will say good evening. I hope you having a great start to your day, Nick. And I hope that this evening's session is gonna come of great use to not only yourself, but everyone else joining. And uh, yes, I look forward to this session. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Karina, hello. Good evening. I hope you're doing well. So I assume you can all hear me, seeing that I'm getting messages coming through. So, yeah, I think that is all sorted. Um, yes, we are safe. Thank you, Keaton. I hope you are doing well and keeping safe. Um, it is a crazy time we're living in. It's like being a movie. Um, but yeah, restrictions are slightly lifted in South Africa now. Um, it's pretty much level 4.9, coming down from level 5. Um, but I think our president is speaking a bit later this this week probably tomorrow evening sometime to give us an update but uh yeah we'll see what happens and um, but i hope everyone else is keeping safe keeping healthy and still remaining positive and keaton i'm glad you're looking forward to this i'm also very excited about this evening's um chat it's going to be a lot of fun and it is tools and shortcuts and things i use in my everyday life. Um, and I don't know what that says about me. Maybe I process too many images, <laughs> but yet again, it is what I do. It's my living, my bread and butter. Um, Yelena, hello, hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining yet again. And if you're just joining, I see this little few names popping up here. Good evening. Thank you for taking the time to join me this evening. And I do hope that tonight's chat is going to help you somewhat. Please feel free to leave any questions you may have in the Q&A tab that you will find right down here at the bottom somewhere. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to leave them there for me. Um, when I share a screen, it is quite difficult for me to see the questions. So I will get to answering all of your questions once I am done showing you the ins and outs about what I frequently use while I work and process in Lightroom. Um, but it is now six o'clock, so I, I see there are still a few people joining, but I'm sure they will catch up. Um, but this evening, we are chatting about an Adobe product called Lightroom. I'm sure a lot of you who have joined have joined for a good enough reason you obviously have Lightroom or looking at investing in Lightroom and starting to use it to process your raw images. And for a lot of people who are kind of first time visitors to the particular software, um, and I was in this very same boat as well, for a very long time, I thought Lightroom was just a, <clears throat> a quick fix up tool to images. Um, I could make a, a dull look, image look a little bit better. I even believe that you could make a blurry or out of focus image sharp again. Uh, this is not the case, uh, but there are a lot of tools and some of them I'm gonna chat about today that I never knew, knew of for many years prior to really digging into Lightroom and getting to grips with how the program actually works and how well you can um, use it to your advantage, not only when processing your images, but for the workflow um, or the entire process and the workflow that um, comes with that. Um, so let me jump into Lightroom over here quickly and we can then get started. There we go. Let me just move this out of the way. I don't need that there. All right, so for many of you, you would know that your pretty much your default Lightroom interface looks 
something like this. And as I mentioned, there is a lot that one can do in Lightroom, a lot of tools that are hidden that you can use to your advantage when it comes to this particular software. And this evening, I'm going to run through a handful of tips that I use on a day-to-day -day basis every single day. Um, and I hope that these little tricks or shortcuts can help you when it comes to processing your images and speeding up your workflow a little bit um, when you are working in Lightroom. So let's jump into the first particular tip that I want to share with everyone. I'm going to either double click this image or you can just hit the letter E to enlarge it. And the first thing I want to share with all of you, and I'm sure you're also all wondering, is why does he have his tabs open on each side? Why are those panels there? I usually don't. For the purpose of this particular webinar, I want to start off like this just to show to you right now, the image I want to work with is this particular chunk of ice on the Diamond Beach in Iceland, and I want to start processing it. But I'm currently hosting this on my, my laptop, and to see fine detail in this image, I really have to come and sit like close in because it's quite a small, um, it's rendering quite small on the screen because of these tabs that are on the side. So a nice quick shortcut to getting rid of tabs on either side is just by simply tapping the tab key and there, boom, you have a much bigger reference of the image you would like to work with. Hit tab, it brings those panels back. But for now, I'm keeping this away. We don't need it there. And um, moving on, let's go into develop. We hit D, you can either click the develop module up here, or you can just hit the letter D, and it takes you straight into your develop module. And as I've mentioned, and this all comes down to personal preference, and it comes down to how you want to manage your workflow, but usually when I process an image, you have the option of hiding this particular tab um, or column on the right over here. Let me just go close all of these quickly. Um, and when you come back and hover over the image, it disappears. When I process, I like to keep it there. Reason being is because when it's not there, permanently there, and I'm working in basic, you can see almost a third of my image is hiding behind that panel. So I like to keep this particular panel out so that I can still see a good large um, representation of this image here while I still see all of these guys to the right. But what I want to chat about first, and this is the second tip that I want to share with you guys, is if you hit R, or just go and click on your grid overlay over there, but by hitting R, it takes you straight into your grid overlay. And I'm not sure if many of you knew this, because like I'd mentioned for years prior to me um, truly understanding how Lightroom works, I had no idea that this was possible. So when you're in your grid overlay, obviously the default setting is this rule of thirds option. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. But to change this overlay and to cycle through different grid overlays and to change up your composition a little bit, you just hit the letter O. And this, keep hitting O, you'll keep flicking through different. I see someone's question popped in, and I will get to that once we're done with this section. Um, but one I like quite a lot is this particular one. It obviously gives you the dimensions, five by seven, four by five, for if you want to crop to that size or print or whatever it may be, this gives you a good representation as to how your image will look and feel if you want to crop it or print to that size. And lastly, and this one's going to throw you for a loop, pun intended, is this golden spiral. And if it is not sitting in the right position for you, just simply push and hold shift and then hit O, and you will see that this spiral then changes position. Do you see that? So basically what this overlay is there for is it's basically designed to show 
you while you're processing like um we are doing right now how your viewer's eye is basically gonna flow through this image and move through it when they're viewing it and right now and it, it not per se that they're going to start in the bottom left corner and come around you're probably going to see that block of ice first which the end of the spiral is touching so compositionally this is a great image or composed well and then from there your eye is going to flow off the block of ice look at the horizon see the sea and then move down into this area where the water is flowing back into the ocean over these little rocks so it's quite a fun tool and it's nice to play around with this overlay and just by simply tapping o you can flick through the particular overlays okay moving on to the next image this particular tip i want to share now is one i'm going to label level out and the reason why i call it level out is we're going to go back into the crop ratio by hitting R or simply touching or, or clicking on this little crop ratio tool over here. A lot of the times I find myself flicking through Instagram and I see this beautiful image, but the horizon is just a bit, and I don't know, for me, it's, it's difficult to like double tap that. I don't want to really like it because it's a great image, but I find myself sitting like this, looking at the image because the horizon is a little bit skewed and I intentionally, for the purpose of this exercise have went to go and crop a skew horizon because it is a little bit off-putting top left corner not a lot of sky top right corner there's a lot more sky so it's telling me that my horizon is very skewed so you can either use hover over the, the side of the image it gives you that little left and right tool you can either manually go and try and find a straight horizon but it's not always entirely accurate so one way in which you can speed up this process and find the dead straight horizon is either go and left click on this angle tool. Once you left click this, you will then select the tool. If you want to speed the process up even more, just push and while you're in the crop ratio, push and tap. Um, why is it not giving me the option? There you go. Push and tap command. And you'll see if you hold command, that angle tool is now where the little hand used to be. So now you can go and select a point on the horizon, left click and hold, and drag across the horizon, let go of it all, and boom, it straightens up your horizon beautifully. So you don't have to sit there and try and figure out, okay, where is it straight? Is it perfect? Is it not? That little angle tool, just by clicking and holding command, left clicking on the one side of your horizon, dragging across, letting go, is going to drop it down beautifully for you. So that was that one. Next tip, moving on to a particular tool that will be used for individuals who aren't too familiar with Lightroom. Um, so for people who've been using the software and understand it quite well by now, won't find this too handy but for people who are new to the software and don't understand how a lot of these sliders work you can use something that's called auto tone so under your basic panel over here you'll see that you have a little word over here tone and to the right of that the word auto so basically what's going to happen is when i click on auto it is going to automatically go and make adjustments to this image for me. And this is basically just giving us a rough starting point as to how we can now move forward and continue processing this image. Because by hitting auto tone, this is by no means the final product. It is just giving you a good starting point, a good reference. Um, and in my opinion, a lot of the times what I see happen in auto tone is it takes highlights down, shadows up, whites up a bit, blacks down a bit, always push the saturation up, uh, uh, vibrance up, and drop saturation a little bit. Um, so this is generally the, the kind of go-to for the auto tone most of the time. In this particular image, you can see, on my screen at least, the whole image came out quite orange. So what you can do 
if you have processed an image, often you find if you go find pure whites and pure blacks while processing, your image comes out either very blue or very orange. As this one is, it's quite orange. You just move up to your temperature slider. And that is why it's important to shoot in raw format because then you can go and make changes to your white balance. If you were shooting JPEG, you cannot make these changes. So what I can do here is just hover over this particular tab and you'll see that the 5,600 value is grayed out. So it's telling me that that slide is activated. And then I just hit the down arrow key on my keyboard and I decrease the amount of temperature in there making this image a little bit cooler. And so this is now taking that very burnt out orangey color away and out of the scene. And to me, this looks a lot better. Um, and then if you go into your before and after just by hitting Y, you can already see that's quite a big difference just by hitting autotone, dropping temperature a little bit because it was too orange. This is a great starting point, particularly for those, as I've mentioned, who have not used Lightroom a lot. Okay. And what I had also found myself doing years back is a lot of unnecessary work to my images. I had spent way too long processing one particular image, over-processed over my image probably 95% of the time. And I always found myself just resetting everything and starting over. And there is this reset button. So if I go and hit reset, it takes your image back to the raw for, or the raw look. No adjustments made. This is what we don't want to do right now, because if you have a greater understanding of how Lightroom works, but you have went and made dramatic changes like this, I'm going to go crazy here, just for the purpose of this this exercise. If you do not want to reset the whole image, and you get super frustrated because I used to, yes, I used to lose my mind doing this before I learned how to do it properly, is you can go and reset individual sliders, either by dragging it to zero, but you like, you try and like, oh, oh, ah, oh, you like try and find zero and it's such a frustration to get it on zero. So you can either highlight by left clicking that tab and hitting zero, it takes it to zero, but a much quicker way is just double tapping on each word. And it goes and resets it automatically for you. So that is just a quick reset and it is not for the entire image, it is for individual sliders. So I hope this one has taught you guys something. And let's move on to clipping. I don't know if a lot of you would know of what clipping is, and it is something you usually won't see in an image off the bat. And in areas like Iceland, for example, where there is a lot of snow, it may be visible off the get-go, um, but for most environments where you're shooting out in Africa, out in the field, in the bush, you probably won't see this off the bat. But how you would activate the clipping tool in Lightroom is by hitting the J key. So if you hit J, you will see I've now activated it. And in the bottom half of this image, there are a few blue specks. So what clipping is going to tell you is where your, a particular piece in your image is underexposed too much or vice versa, overexposed too much. So off the bat and automatically here, we have big blue patches down in this foreground here. The reason for this is it's because my pure blacks in this image, these are areas that are burnt out. They are too dark and I have lost detail in them. So what you can do, you can either lift the shadows quite a bit and you'll see that blue has faded away out of this area, or a lot of it has. You can also then lift your blacks, and there you have no more blue clippings, and you have most of your detail back in this foreground. Taking exposure right, oh, looks like we can push this quite far. There we go. Red gets introduced. So this is quite late for this particular scene. But all these areas where you see red appearing, this is where your image is way too bright. Already, I mean, just down here, I would have said that's way too bright already. But the purpose of clipping 
is just for the beautiful technology within the Lightroom software is telling us where we have overexposed our image um, in these red areas over here. So as I mentioned, usually in most scenes, your natural eye will not pick this up even while you're processing. You won't pick it up, but it's a great tool to use if you are scared of losing details in certain areas, uh, either in the shadowed or the highlight areas. It's a great tool to use for while processing instead of keeping your eye up here on the histogram where you can also see it in these little triangles. Let me quickly go and clip on the right again. You'll see that triangle is highlighted blue. You can also see it there, even while clipping is off. If you go and burn that area, you'll see the triangle is illuminated. But having to move your eye up to that histogram the whole time is quite a nuisance. So it's great to process with using clipping because then when you work through your image, you don't have to always look away from it up to the histogram. You can just keep your eyes <coughs> fixated on your image. Let's move on to, oh, there's another clipping scene. And the reason why I have this in here is just to also explain to you guys in, with regards to clipping, I'm gonna take clipping off by hitting the J key. A lot of the times clipping is not necessarily a bad thing because in this image, if I activate my clipping again, you will see a lot of shadowed areas up here and the red highlighted areas are burnt out and I've lost detail. And this is what it's trying to tell you is that you've lost detail in these areas, but for a particular scene like this, I do not care if I've lost detail in that ice because this is natural light was falling through this ice cave. It is gonna be very bright, but my main story here is I want people to kind of see this because I want them to look from the top down through this cave and then I want their eyes to fall on this little stream of water that's going to lead their eye out and to the entrance of the cave. So even though I've lost detail here, it's not a bad thing because I don't want people to go and stare at this and only look at that piece of ice. I want their eyes to flow through this image. So even though that is a clipping area for the purpose of what I try to achieve here, it is not a problem. Moving on to a black and white tip. So you will see what I've done here is I've done a, a rough edit to this image just to get a little bit of um, contrast and detail back into the image. But one tool I love using here is this particular little guy over here. So even though this image, ah, you see what I'm finding myself doing now is sliding up and down all the time. So this brings me to a point before I go on to this particular tool is I'm not sure if a lot of you would know about this, but it's a tool called solo mode. So looking at this knife, I want to go work blacks and whites. I have to scroll all the way down past everything to get to these individual colors. One way in which you can speed up your process is just by right clicking on one of the, the, the panel words, basic or tone curve, whichever one it may be, and go and left click and select solo mode. So what this is going to do is if I open up basic, all other tabs close. If I open black and white, all other tabs close. So basically what this is doing is it's just preventing you from having to go and scroll through of a lot of drop down panels to get to the one you want to be working with. So just select solo mode and this is going to speed up your process quite well. But now that we're in black and white, we're on a black and white image, go and select this little tool because this is a great help. Even though you've converted your color image, just by hitting the letter V, we'll take it into black and white, but even though it's now a monochromatic image on Lightroom, Lightroom is still referencing your raw file, which is sitting safely, in my case, on my external hard drive, and it is referencing a color image, not a black and white image. So what this means is that I can still process individual colors within the scene, 
even though it's a black and white image. But if you're sitting here, instead of flicking between black and white and color by hitting V the whole time to see, okay, what color's on the elephant? What color's the sky? What color's this? Just go and click this little tool, select this little guy over here, move across, you will see your cursor has now changed. And now that I'm hovering over the sky, notice what happens along these panels. Let me just go and double click that. Notice what happens along these panels. When I hover over the sky, it's telling me, okay, wherever that little cursor's cross is sitting, this is a blue color. I'm gonna come onto my elephant that were orange. You will see that, that little grayed out block next to the orange slider is telling us that orange is activated there. Come down to the grass, it's gonna tell us yellows and greens in the grass. And so it is very easy to pinpoint particular colors in an image just by using that tool. And what makes this quite um, impactful when it comes to processing is, let me do this quickly. What I'm doing is I'm hovering over the sky, instead of going back and moving blue left and right, hovering over that blue, and with two fingers on my touchpad on the, on the laptop, I'm just gonna slide down and it's gonna decrease the amount of blue and therefore darken up that sky because it's taking the blue color in the sky and because I'm sliding it down, I'm making it darker. So it's making that sky very moody. If I come over to the elephant, this is the orange color. We're gonna slide upwards to brighten up the elephant a little bit. They popping out nicely. And then let's go find a green part in the grass. There we go. And we can, oh, that's changing the yellow as well. So let's just go move that green down by using this little button to darken up that foreground of it. And there, by putting that on and off, already makes a major difference to the image, just because I went to go and use individual colors in my black and white scene. So, Great tip to use, and I hope it's one that you will be able to put to good use as well. <clears throat> Moving on to a special adjustment that I use. Well, I use all of these every single day. I literally sit on Lightroom at least for 30 minutes every single day. I'm always on it. Um, and in all honesty, the only way for you to really get to full grips with Lightroom is by putting in the time. And even if it is just 30 minutes a day, after work or before bed, wherever it may be, just spend time on it. And the more time you spend on it, the more this workflow just kind of kind of embed itself. You're going to find your own style of editing and processing. The more you do it, the better you're going to become at it. But one I use every single day is my radial filter tool. And what I like to do a lot is a lot of the time people will go into effects and they're gonna use a post crop vignette. So basically you can either darken up edges or brighten those edges. And a lot of the time what I find is when you do go and set your midpoints and your roundness as to where you want it to end, there are always odd strange patches that are still way too bright that just shouldn't be there. So often what I use my radial filter for here is I will go and click and drag this filter around my animal. If you hit O for overlay, you will see the green area is the area that's gonna be affected. And then you can either invert that by taking all the settings you're gonna make on the panel on the right to adjust whatever is inside the circle. But right now, I don't want to invert this because I wanna keep this little baby's face nice and light and I want to darken up that surrounding area and I always like to use a very heavy feather and this is not this is something that vignetting option in that post crop vignette doesn't give you is that um, it doesn't give you that accurate feather or as accurate of a feather than um, as this particular tool would do so what you can do if there are parts of this baby gorilla that this heavy feather is falling onto within this tool you can go and select brush. Note, it's not the special adjustment brush, it is the brush within the radial filter tool. So if I go and select that brush, come over to the side, you'll see my cursor has now changed to the brush tool, but it's the brush within 
the radial filter. By pushing and holding Alt, you can then go and brush it off the area you do not want it to fall on. And then you can move back to edit if you do not want to be using the brush anymore. And you will get back to changing your um, settings for this particular filter. I'm going to hit O to get my overlay back. And then usually what I like to do here is I will go and just drop exposure and usually a very little bit of clarity around the sides of this particular filter. The reason why I do this is because you, your viewer's eyes are going to be attracted to the brightest part of the image and the sharpest part of the image. So by dropping my exposure around the sides of this animal and the clarity a little bit, making it slightly softer, the eyes, my viewer's eyes should go and focus, boom, directly on this little baby over here. So if I now come down and put that on and off toggle, you will see how that's dramatically changed the effect of that image and how your eyes are going to be fixated on that baby gorilla. Um, and that is that. I hope that that tool helps. Um, it does help me. I use it in almost every single image, particularly in images where I'm trying to isolate one particular animal. Whereas in this scene, it's a baby gorilla, trying to isolate it. Darkening up those um, surrounding areas slightly will definitely help you. Um, and then obviously, wanting to see your before and after images to see what you have done comparing your raw file to your process file a lot of people like to use the letter y so you can either go and click on that little tool down there click it again gives you a different view again and again and again you can vary through them but i find what this does and it is a great representation let me just go and get rid of this side for now but you're going to have to now, as the person processing, look at the raw file, move over, look at the process file, move over, look at the raw file. So your eyes get really busy, and therefore, you can tire, tire your eyes very quickly in doing this. So what I like to use most is, this is obviously only possible while in the develop module, is I hit the backslash key, and that takes me to my before tap it again to my after, before and after. So it's a nice quick way in which you can flick through just at your fingertip. You just tap that backslash once, takes, it, takes you to your before. Tap it again, takes you to after. And this is such a great tool I use on every single image when I'm done processing, or even during my process, I go and tap that backslash just to see if I've over-processed it, um, in this case, I do think I have, if you look at how burnt out black and orange this area is. Um, but just for the purpose of this exercise, it's a good tool to use to see, okay, yes, that, that background's darkened up quite a lot, and I like the look and feel of it. If you're happy with your end result and you're done with it, the last thing I do on every single one of my images is I go into lights out. I make it go dark. So the way you can do this, and I'm not going to do it now, I have got images that I can flick through that will show you what I'm trying to explain. But if I go into my light out mode now, it is gonna shut down my Lightroom and your screen's gonna go black. You won't see me, you won't see my Lightroom. But I did take screenshots of these examples. So if I did hit L now, if I hit L once, this, Oh, no, that is the, the actual look, the way it looks now. If you hit L once, it will dim out the surrounding areas. If you hit it a second time, it'll make it pitch black. And the reason why I use this and why I love using this is it's a great opportunity to eliminate your eyes while you've processed from distracting elements on the outside because I'm sure you'll all agree with me that by looking at the finished image with very bright sides, the word library, my name, your toolbar down at the bottom, those are distracting pieces of contrast that your eye wants to flip and move to. So if you just hit L once, 
hit L twice, and you have this pure black background, this is a great way just to either admire your work and just take it in for five minutes and sit there and really enjoy it, or take this opportunity to try and find what could I potentially fix in this image without having other distracting elements drawing your eye away. In this particular scene, sitting back looking at this, I would say, okay, this corner is still slightly bright. This very bright piece of leaf is a no-go and something that I need to get rid of. Then you just hit L again. For the third time, it takes you back into the normal view, normal orientation, and it's nice and bright, and you can start processing again. Um, so I hope that this helps, and I hope that these few tips are ones that you will put to use in the future, and I hope that it will not only speed up your workflow a little bit, um, but help you out throughout the process as well. I see there was a, a question that had popped through. So let me quickly stop sharing that and let's jump into the question. Ah, Keaton, someone wants to join. Where do I get the link? Um, as the link is no more on your story. Oh, Keaton, if you wouldn't mind, this, this particular episode will be live on YouTube in the coming days. So please direct whoever it was who wanted to join to our YouTube channel and they can go see all of our previous webinars and this particular one as well. Um, sorry about that. But thank you for the question. All right, so that is basically the few tips I wanted to share with all of you this evening. If there are any of you that have Lightroom questions, please, now is the time. Um, leave me a question so that I can see and answer this for you. I see there's quite a few chats coming through here. Let me just close that and open this up here. There we go. I don't know if any of you have left questions in the chats. No, I do not. Um, Grace, I'm very happy that you had found it interesting. Um, thank you for joining. I really do appreciate your time. All right, guys, so anyone got questions? You need to leave it in the Q&A. We still have about 10 minutes. But it doesn't look like there are any questions popping up. If there is one that pops up later and you couldn't think of it off the bat now, please send me an email, michael at wild-i.ca.za, and I will get back to you on that. Um, yes, Keaton, we can talk a bit about exporting formats. Um, and then Mar, I've got a question over here, uh, rather minimal on natural look or extremely edited. So this is entirely up to you, Mar. Um, I tend to try and process my images as naturally as possible. So I try and keep them looking as natural as possible. Um, obviously enhancing a few colors here and there, but not like, I don't go massive like HDR look. Some of my black and whites, I do go heavy moody and very dark. Um, some gorilla images I've gone really arty dark, but for the most part, I go minimal and natural as possible. Keaton, exporting formats. We can chat exporting formats. Let's quickly go back into Lightroom here and we can chat briefly here. Um, this is quite a broad topic. So say for example, I wanted to export this particular screenshot. Let's go into export. You obviously can export to specific locations. So you can either choose your desktop if you go into choose, you can then go and choose wherever you want to export these images to. But you want to speak of format and sizing. So into format, what I usually do for social pages, when you want to send it onto Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, wherever it may be, JPEG at 1280 longest edge at 72 pixels per inch. This is usually the best for these platforms because if you go much larger, either a larger file format, such as a TIFF, or a larger file size, 300 DPI, 
at full resolution, so you take that off, what happens is people are going to sit on their phone, get to your image, and it's going to load forever because it's, it's a much larger file. So what's going to happen? People are going to scroll past it. So for social platforms, it's good to keep it at a JPEG, 100% quality, resize it to 1280 and then 72 DPI. If you are looking at printing an image, go nice and go big. It's going to have to be a big file. Usually the best, and you can chat to your printers about this because they often tell you, listen, this is the, the image format we need. This is the color ratio we need. Um, these are, this is the resolution we'd need. So if you are looking at printing, it'll probably definitely be a TIFF file, um, but the sizing thereof is gonna come down to the size of your image itself, but also down to the requirements from the printers as well. So as I've mentioned, this is a very broad topic. Keaton, thanks for that question. It's a really great question. And if you, got, if you want more information on this, send me a mail or a, a message on Instagram and we can go into more depth regarding that. Nikki, are there any tips on cataloging? Um, I think Jerry had done a catalog tip <clears throat> a while back. Catalog is a very long topic to discuss, um, but it is a very important um, subject. You can go look at the WildEye YouTube channel. There's good answers under Lightroom tutorials that Jerry had filmed quite a few years ago. And he chats about cataloging in there. Um, but if you want to set up some time to discuss chat, um, cataloging, send me an email and we can set up a chat to discuss this. Because if you are new to um, Lightroom and you want to get that workflow going and running as smoothly as possible, that sorting of your catalog, your folders, keeping everything in order is vital. Because if you don't do this, it happened to me in the past because I thought I knew what I was doing on Lightroom, I did not. I lost a lot of files. So cataloging is important. And right now my best tip is do it properly off the bat. Make sure your images are being stored in the same location. Don't have files on your external hard drive and some files on your laptop and some files on another hard drive and some files and because that's how you're going to do stuff. Make sure all your files live together. Thanks for that, Nikki. Cool question. Jan, do you ever use the Lightroom app? I used to use the Lightroom app, not really for processing, but what I used it for is when you create catalogs, you can sync those catalogs to the Lightroom app and then off the Lightroom app, download the image onto your phone and then share off from there. I haven't used it much recently. Um, it's, my syncing is not um, working too well and it, it takes forever because there's so much data that has to now sync. Um, so I don't use it too regularly, but when I did use it, it was great. It was easy to access my images and particularly out on Safari if guests asked about a scene or an image um, or something to look for when there was a moment building was a cool quick reference on the phone when my laptop was at the lodge. It is a cool app. Um, it does take up quite a bit of space on your phone though. Iago, uh, what is the difference between Lightroom CC and Lightroom CC Classic? So basically short, short version, Lightroom CC is a cloud um, based product and Lightroom Classic CC is the one, the, the harder copy that lives on your device. Um, and the difference there is there's a lot more tools that you can access on Lightroom Classic than there is on the cloud-based um, product. So if you are seriously looking at working on Lightroom and investing in it, that would be the best possible route is going the harder copy with the software living on your device and not pulling it off the cloud. Um, with updates as well, it runs a lot more smoother um, and there's just regular updates coming in from them. Uh, whereas the cloud-based version, I don't know, anything that's got to do with cloud-based stuff, I do not trust too much. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, Nikki, you're most welcome. Thank you for the question. Um, and I see there were a few more things popping up in chat, Keaton. I'm so glad that you found this super. I really appreciate you joining. So great hearing from you. I hope that 
you all have enjoyed the session. Thank you all for your questions. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, this was a great, a great session. I hope you all have a fantastic evening further, or wherever you are in this world. I hope you have a great morning, if it is in the morning, a great lunch break, if it is midday, and a great evening, if it is evening. Um, but thank you once again. I really do appreciate everyone's time. And yeah, be sure you will be seeing me in future episodes in the weeks to come. Thanks again. and. Bye-bye.